Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to the Nixon Library stage, Daniel Krauthammer. Thank you, Jonathan, for that very kind introduction. Uh, let me check first. Can everybody hear me OK? I was told to check on this. <laughs> um, uh, well, thank you again to Jonathan, to the Nixon Foundation uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, and thank you to everyone here tonight uh, for taking the time out of your evening to come and hear about my father and his last book. It's an honor to be here with you, and that honor is one I wish very dearly could have been my father's today rather than my own, uh, but fate would have it otherwise. I will do my best to represent him and his legacy and to convey to you tonight what I think were some of his most important thoughts and beliefs. And that same purpose and goal in as succinct a way as I can put it, uh, is the goal that I had for the book that I'm here to talk about tonight. My father's posthumous collection, The Point of It All. I'm, I have to warn you, I'm pretty new to all of this, uh, to book tours, um, to giving speeches, uh, and most especially to the difficult balance uh, of representing my father and his work but not pretending to be a spokesperson in the days beyond his life or to interpret his thoughts for our own political moment. So I'll ask you to bear with me as I feel my way through this tonight. Uh, I'll begin by explaining a bit about the book, its origins and its meaning, and then go on to speak a bit about how it fits into the context of my father's whole career and life's work. This book, The Point of It All, started its life several years ago, following the success of my father's earlier collection of columns and essays, Things That Matter. That book was a surprise success, a uh, surprise to my father and his publisher, <laughs> selling, <laughs> selling over a million copies. Uh, there were many articles that my father wasn't able to put into that book, however, that were important to him some that didn't fit the themes and chapter groupings of that book, some that were written in the years since, some that he felt were too personal that time round, and some that were original and never before published, uh, and that he wanted to present all of these in a lasting way in another collection. As most of you know, my father uh, made his last public appearance in August of 2017. He was at that point, he underwent a surgery uh, to remove a cancerous tumor. The recovery period was supposed to be short. It was not. Uh, my father spent the next 10 months in hospital, uh, and I was with him by his side for that whole time. Uh, for many of those months, the prospects looked good, and we thought uh, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. My father even got back to work on this book, uh, and it was at that point that I became involved in the project uh, as I helped to set up his hospital room with all the computers and printouts he needed uh, and talked with him about what he envisioned for the book uh, and all the steps going forward. That didn't last, however, and uh, when the doctors delivered the final prognosis and my father knew that he wouldn't be able to complete the book himself, he asked me to finish it for him. Uh, the last thing he said to me about the book was, if it's not worthy, don't publish it. I promised him I would make sure it was worthy, and that promise, as with the entire responsibility of finishing the book for him, is something I have held myself to and committed myself to with more of my being than any other project I've ever undertaken. My own work on the book began in earnest just weeks after my father's passing, when I met with his publishers 
to decide on a course forward for the book. Much of its contents, uh, in fact most of it, was already chosen by my father and already in place when there was still a lot to be done. And I'm actually pretty glad in retrospect that the publishing team only told me after I had completed the manuscript three months later that under normal circumstances they would have allotted a whole year for the project. <laughs> The primary responsibilities that fell to me as editor of the book were to choose additional columns, essays, speeches, and other writings to fill out its pages, to change the ordering, and even remove a couple pieces here and there when needed, to choose and finalize all the chapter groupings, and then to write an introduction explaining the meaning of the book and how and why it all held together. This was a daunting, difficult, an intimidating task, and one that I desperately wished not to get wrong. The one thing that got me through it, and really the one reason I had enough confidence in myself to complete the task, was my father's own trust and confidence in me. There were many times that I went back to an email exchange that he and I had back in 2013, shortly after Things That Matter was published. I had read the book cover to cover in just a few sittings, and immediately after I finished, I sat down and wrote my father a long letter telling him how incredible and magisterial a work I thought it was, and explained to him exactly why I thought what that was. He wrote back to me the following, and I quote, I couldn't wait to tell you how extraordinarily powerful and moving your letter was, and how unbelievably discerning and penetrating. You made me see things I couldn't even see myself. I've been kicking myself now for two days, because in interview after interview, I have had no idea how to answer the question, what is this book about? <laughs> and there you put it in one simple, absolutely stunning sentence. Everything that matters depends ultimately on politics. As soon as I read it, I stopped reading your letter, wrote it down with a few paragraphs of elaboration, and emailed it to myself so I wouldn't lose it." <laughs> End quote. I thought then, and still think now, that he gave me far too much credit. I felt I was just paraphrasing back to him what he had already written in his book. But sometimes it takes a fresh pair of eyes, an outsider's eyes, to point out for you what was already there all along. And I was quite sure it was already there all along in his writing. In the introduction to Things That Matter, he had written this, quote, while science, medicine, art, poetry, architecture, chess, space, sports, number theory, and all things hard and beautiful promise purity, elegance, and sometimes even transcendence. They are fundamentally subordinate. In the end, they must bow to the sovereignty of politics, because in the end, everything, high and low, and most especially high, lives or dies by politics, because of its capacity, when benign, to allow all around it to flourish, and its capacity, when malign, to make all around it wither." End quote. It's an incredible passage, I think, for its breadth, literally taking in everything that matters to the totality of the human experience, and also in its succinct point that all of that, literally all of it, ultimately depends on getting our politics right. The point of it all follows these same themes and philosophy, for they are what underlay everything my father ever wrote. But I think this book takes a different tack, approaches these ideas from a different direction, and I think actually wrestles with these questions at an even deeper level. It was my mother who came up with the title for the point of it all, uh, just as she did, by the way, for things that matter. She's pretty good at this, it turns out. Uh, and as soon as she proposed it, it struck me that it was exactly right. There is no other way, really, to sum up at once the incredible breadth of the book and also its simple pointed argument. It expresses simultaneously 
the two deep beliefs my father held about politics that at once are seemingly paradoxical, but are also the ultimate logical endpoint of his core political philosophy, that the point of life should not be defined by politics, that the point of it all is what we choose and what we make of our own lives, the passions, the beliefs, the relationships, the truths that we come to in charting our own path and finding our own meaning in life. But that we can only enjoy the blessings of this freedom to choose if we get our politics right. Only if we avoid political systems that seek to dictate life's meaning and life's purpose to the individual. Only if we have a political system that establishes a stable and safe superstructure that leaves the individuals within it unmolested and free to find and choose their own meaning and purposes in life. This is the core of what pluralist, liberalist, liberal democracy means. And my father believed in it deeply. He made the point of his own life and his own career to do what he could in all the years he had on this earth to maintain and strengthen and advance that system of free and open and successful politics. And he did it in a way that transfixed so many of us. He thought both deeply and broadly. His writing was both logical and artful. He was both serious and playful, both realistic and optimistic. There are so many traits he combined in his being and in his writing and commentary that are quite rare to ever find together in the same place. And all of these traits, of course, are parts of our ever complex human nature. And I think one of the keys to my father's insights across so many subjects was his perceptive understanding of that human nature. Uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, he was a medical doctor and psychiatrist at first by training, practicing for nearly a decade before he changed career tracks to go into writing and politics. He always refrained from psychologizing and downplayed any notion that his earlier professional background gave him any particular insight when it came to politics. Though he did joke about it quite a bit. <laughs> I, I will depart for a moment to recount one of his favorite jokes he would always tell at events like this, which was that people often asked him, uh, if his background as a psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, gave him any, any particular powers of observation about the goings on in DC. And he said, well, in my first career, I used to, to deal with a lot of megalomaniacs and people with delusions of grandeur. The difference now is I deal with those same people, but they have access to nuclear weapons. <laughs> But stepping back uh, to what I was saying, I think uh, that he did have an insight, uh, but that he just thought it was too fundamental to take any special credit for. Uh, and that is that politics is an extension of human nature played out on a grand scale. It is, after all, just the way we organize our collective behavior in ever larger groupings. There's not some alternate set of rules that kicks in with big populations or nations. Human nature stays the same. It is the one constant throughout all of history, and my father always came back to that. He always saw in the foibles and faults of our politics their root in our individual human nature. He believed the best of politics was always organized around and adapted to human nature as it is with all its faults and all its imperfections. That's why he always had so much reverence and awe for America's political system and its history, for our constitution that was specifically designed for men and not for angels. It sought not to change human nature, not to shape us into new men for a new age or a perfect society. Rather, it accepted people as they are, with all the greed and opportunism and ambition we will always have, and to harness those natural drives, both the sinful and the virtuous, in a system that balances them out, that plays them all out against each other 
to yield an open and free system where no man, no matter how virtuous or how sinful, can dictate to the rest. And it was in the opposite of this kind of political system that my father always saw the greatest of all threats. In politics that seeks not to adapt to human nature, but rather seeks to bend human nature to its own arbitrary notions of what might be good or right or quote unquote true. This was the danger of utopian thinking, my father argued, of endeavoring to create perfect societies or perfect individuals. Nothing could be more anathema to human nature. And the quest to build such utopias, these political romanticisms, as my father called them, led to the greatest of human catastrophes and crimes and abominations, of absolutist and totalitarian systems that seek to remake humanity according to their ideology, that level everything high and beautiful, as my father put it, that stands in the way of that goal. Of the French Revolution and its reign of terror, of Mao's cultural revolution, of Stalin's Russia and Hitler's Germany. This knowledge of and constant awareness of human history and its interplay with human nature gave my father the perspective to see through much of the mundane arguments of our day-to-day -day politics and to see the core issues, the fundamental stakes that really mattered. The true world historical questions that lay at the heart of why we engage and debate about politics in the first place. He had this recognition in mind always of this vital importance of politics done right. And with that, he had a gratitude and a reverence for our own politics, America's constitutional democratic order, which he saw as surely mankind's greatest achievement in its long history with politics. The best embodiment of classical liberal democracy, of an open, pluralist, free society that has now endured and been so successful for almost two and a half centuries. It is imperfect to be sure, but for my father, that was exactly the point. Nothing human is ever perfect. Human nature is not built that way. And it is not built that way for what I think was a closely linked idea in my father's worldview, that human knowledge and human understanding are inherently limited. My father was an incredibly intelligent and knowledgeable man, but that only gave him an ever deeper appreciation of just how little any of us really know in the grand scheme of things. About the universe, its origins and physical laws, about our world, about our own human nature, even about ourselves as individuals. There's the psychiatrist again. <laughs> and it's hubris to think otherwise, and dangerous hubris to think we understand enough to rebuild societies from the ground up, or to perfect human nature, or to dictate to others how best to think and live. This was the philosophical root, in large part, of my father's wariness of modern liberalism. As he put it, quote, 20th century liberalism's newfound perfectionist ambitions, reflected in its current euphemism, progressivism, sought to harness the power of government, the mystique of science, and the rule of experts to shape society and individual character and bring them both, willing or not, to a higher state of being, end quote. Throughout his entire life, my father was always wary of any ideology that claimed to know some singular, absolute, and unassailable truth. In fact, the very first article he ever published, which is something I, I discovered in the process of finishing this book, uh, was written for the McGill Daily, where he went to college, in 1969, when he was 19 years old. It was a critique of the extreme political left and the right of that day, and of what he termed monolithic political thinking and deadening one-dimensionality. It championed pluralism, whose underlying assumption, he wrote, is that no one has a monopoly on the truth. 
My father was an ardent student and advocate of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment and classical liberalism. Most of all, perhaps, John Stuart Mill, on whom my father wrote his thesis in political philosophy when he was studying at Oxford. He saw the vital necessity of a political system where no one has a claim to the absolute truth, where the competition of ideas in a million sense, of a debate and a pluralism of views and opinions defines politics and defines society. But he saw great wisdom too in the arguments of Burke and Chesterton of the value and the need for tradition and continuity and the dangers of constantly seeking to make the world new. In this way, my father combined in his worldview both a classical liberalism and a modern conservatism, and both united above all by a deep humility and recognition of the limits of man's knowledge. An open, liberal, and pluralist society is the only one where, and of the cacophony of good and bad ideas, the best can successfully compete for relevance and gradually rise to the top be tested by logic and evidence, replace failed ideas, and be incorporated into our communal lives. But we must remember, too, that new ideas are not necessarily better than old ones. In fact, it is perhaps more often the opposite. If an idea, a value, a way of life has survived in humanity for generations, we at least know that by definition it is not self-destructive and very likely has redeeming, stabilizing, and desirable qualities. A new idea is by definition untested and full of potential for unforeseen and unintended consequences beyond our own knowledge. There's no law that says that new is better. If there is one thing my father made abundantly clear in enunciating the core of the conservative part of his worldview, it is that history is not redemptive as he put it. It does not automatically and inevitably move toward progress and the good. It does not always bend toward justice. It can regress in every way that matters, in the most terrible of ways. That is what politics gone wrong can do. And as he wrote in the introduction to Things That Matter, that is not ancient history. That is Germany in 1933. This combination of liberal and conservative, of skeptical and reverential, made my father hard to pin down philosophically and politically. Though he described himself as conservative, and it certainly does fit him better than any other categorical title we have, or that I can think of, I often do hesitate to use that word. He was an original thinker and a principled one, and he didn't fit easily into ready-made labels. If, as William F. Buckley put it, a conservative is someone who stands athwart history and yells stop, then I imagine my father in a slightly different position. Perhaps instead, standing athwart history and yelling think. He was not against change or political and social and cultural evolution. He embraced it more than most of his conservative fellow travelers, and much for that same reason, I think, had a sunnier and more optimistic view and appraisal of the future than many conservatives often do. But he was skeptical of change, as he was skeptical of any unproven claim to some new and previously undiscovered truth, simply because humanity, in all its unwisdom, has an extraordinary capacity for bad ideas. History has shown us that, and it is nothing but foolhardy to assume that we, in our present day, have some unique wisdom and insight into human nature and politics that our forefathers did not. We should always be open to change and improvement, for we inherit from the past much that is unjust and inhumane, but we should always be testing and thoughtful in the process, and always have both gratitude and reverence for the ideas that got us this far along in human progress in the first place, and not to discard them without serious thought and deliberation, especially in America, 
where we have the incredible good fortune of inheriting the philosophical and political system that was bequeathed to us by those who came before. A system whose founding was, as my father put it, so fortuitous and so unlikely in the course of human history that he was at times moved to describe it as a miraculous or providential event. The great thinkers who explained and laid the foundation of the American experiment I think probably exemplify and embody my father's philosophy best of all. Jefferson, Madison, Tocqueville, my father came back to them time and again. They melded theory and practice, ideals and realities in a way that spoke to my father's core understanding of human nature with all its contradictions and all its messiness. The system of limited government, of a free society that allowed individuals to pursue their own goals and find their own meaning and free association with each other. This was the great gift of the founders my father saw, the precious gift of the enlightenment, as he put it. And it should be guarded by every generation, for it is a rare and precious thing in the history of mankind. My father put this sentiment most succinctly and wonderfully, I think, in a commencement speech he gave at McGill University uh, some 25 years ago, uh, which is included in the point of it all. Save the best, he wrote. Conserve what's best in the past. Tradition is the ultimate democracy because it extends the franchise to generations past and benefits from their hard-earned wisdom." End quote. One of the areas where I think this kind of thinking is the most apparent and oftentimes the most poignant and moving in my father's writing, both in the point of it all and all throughout his career, was in talking about questions of medical ethics and of life and death decisions. In the 2000s, uh, he served on the President's Council for Bioethics. And in that capacity, um, he spent a great deal of time talking about the intricacies and complex moral questions of stem cell research, which I'm sure a lot of you remember from years and decades past has often been a very contentious topic. And he brought both his medical background and his philosophical outlook to bear on these questions. On this, on this matter and on related issues of abortion, end of life care, and assisted suicide, his argument was never black and white, never absolutist in any claim to ultimate knowledge of these deepest questions of human life and death. Instead, he grounded his argument in exactly that inability to know ultimate truth. He beseeched us all to have humility in the face of these awesome questions, and for that reason to err on the side of human life rather than on the side a pretended mastery of science and of human nature. Because once ancient and long-held moral boundaries on these most precious of human values are breached, he argued, the way back is a difficult one, and all the ways forward to a brave new world of unintended consequences are many. This kind of reverence for the unknown and the unknowable extended beyond politics for my father and really to every aspect of his life. From the deepest ruminations on the origins of the universe to appreciation of lighthearted pastimes like an afternoon at the ballpark. That and everything in between are on full and to me a very beautiful display in the point of it all. Across all its chapters, my father writes about everything from chess and movies and sports to fatherhood and friendship and his own subtle and understated philosophy of life. He downplayed the wisdom he brought to all these subjects in his own characteristic way, inserting wry humor and irreverent nods to all the peculiarities and absurdities of life at every turn. But in so many ways, that was the quiet key to his insight. He downplayed his own understanding of all these things that fill life with beauty and joy and meaning, yet he used the artfulness of his writing to make you feel that very meaning deep in your own heart. 
somewhere just beyond your ability to fully understand and articulate it in your mind, which is exactly where my father found it himself. It was a long and difficult process for me completing this book for my father, but a deeply rewarding and meaningful one. In making sure that I didn't miss anything that ought to be in the point of it all, I went back and read essentially everything he had ever written, which is almost 2,000 columns, essays, speeches, and other writings. Don't worry, you don't have to read that many in the book. <laughs> but that process was quite an incredible one for me, uh, and in many ways, an indescribable experience. But it's an experience that I hope and believe in a small way everyone who reads this book will uh, and can have. My father's words in this book, as in all his writing, speak to me in very deep and powerful ways. They open my mind, stir my spirit, and move my heart. And I hope that they will do the same for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks very much. Daniel has agreed to answer your questions. I just want to announce that the point of it all is available at the museum store for purchase, and Daniel will be happy to meet with you and sign the copies of your books. Um, I'd like to start off with the first question. Uh, what, was the, what was your father's favorite topic to write about? That's a tough one. Uh, I think he got the biggest kick maybe out of writing about chess just because he knew everybody else would think he was totally nuts <laughs> for, how, for how deep into it he was. Uh, as, he, as he wrote in one of his columns, he drove uh, up to New York from Washington, D.C. on not one but two occasions to watch the World Chess Championships. <laughs> um, so I think that baseball, I think those kind of off-topic personal passions were probably some of his favorites. Question right here. It's such a pleasure to have you here, Daniel. Um, could you speak to your dad's um, sense of optimism for the future of America, given the divisiveness that yeah. ensued after our election in 2016 and, and what uh, you know we're, we're going through today? Give yeah. us some hope. Yeah. Um, well, luckily, I, I can very truthfully convey that, because uh, I myself have certainly had a lot of those same feelings of, you know, where are we? What's going on? What does the future hold? Um, but as I mentioned, my father was in a, in a pretty unique way, both incredibly realistic, not an ounce of naivete uh, in him, and he, he really enjoyed pointing out and deconstructing naivete in others, um, but at the same time optimistic, which don't often uh, hold together, and he was always particularly optimistic about America and its future. And uh, there's, there's one entry in the book, uh, which might be my favorite, actually. It's, in the book, it's titled Constitutions, Conservatism, and the Genius of the Founders. And in it, he gets really deep into to what his political philosophy means, what limited government is and should be. But at the end, uh, he, he steps back and talks about American history in a more holistic sense. Um, and his feeling of just how incredibly unlikely our own history is and how lucky we are that it's turned out the way it has. How we've always had the leaders and the thinkers at the moments that we needed them in history to give us the ideals and the politics and the system that we have and live by today. And how, as he put it, America's history always finds a way to redeem itself, that we, we have a system that's built to make mistakes and correct them. Uh, and that, as he said, he had incredible faith 
in the bedrock decency of the American people to eventually figure things out and get it right. And that reading that passage actually always brings a smile to my face because um, it really does, uh, I can see him smiling, writing it and saying it, but it gives me faith and strength too uh, that we'll find our way. We have a question right here. I've read the other book and I loved it, Things That Matter. And I, I've noticed all the way through, I've admired his Fox News presentations, how, as we were just saying, you enter the end of a day and you see the, the, the frustration that goes with the uh, media that's not telling all the truths, it's one-sided. And you come back and you'd hear Mr. Krauthammer talking and he resolved things quietly, and you went to bed within peace. <laughs> <clears throat> At least most of the time. <laughs> but the thing that I wanted to point out was I noticed the absence of uh, the fact that this is one nation under God. And he didn't emphasize a great deal of ethereal or religious uh, conviction. And uh, the fact that our founders were all strong in, in faith uh, Perhaps uh, it wasn't so miraculous, but intended by a greater being. What's your feeling on, on his, his, his feeling toward faith? Sure. Um, well, he wrote about this too and talked about it sometimes, not a lot, because he, he didn't, wasn't in his, in his nature to kind of make a big deal of his own personal beliefs or really anything about himself. Um, but uh, he had a, a pretty complex uh, sense of faith and religiosity. He wasn't, he didn't describe himself as, as a person of faith or, or great religious belief. He grew up in an Orthodox Jewish household, but, uh, and his Jewish identity was incredibly important to him and, and a core part of his identity. Um, but he didn't uh, believe in a, uh, a God that involved himself in history, so to speak. He had a, a real sense that there was something out there, part of his reverence for the unknown, as I put it, um, as he put it too in some places, was that uh, he said he, he was skeptical of, of uh, claims to truth on this, but most especially of the claims of atheism. He always said to him that was the, the most unbelievable uh, of all religious faiths. Um, but when it came to your point on American history, you know, he did come close, I think, in emotional ways. He, he, he put it in this piece in the book, uh, you know, not literally, but he, he did feel that if there's something out there, there was some involvement here, that there was something, it's so unlikely, so fortuitous that it, it was one of the few things I think ever that made him consider that extra step. Uh, but I'm not gonna put any more words in his mouth than that, that's what he said. But, um, but he, he read the founders a lot and you know, some of them were of more explicit uh, Christian or religious faith, some were more deist in their outlook, uh, which would maybe match a little more what my father's own beliefs were. But, but he really, he had great respect for religion and its importance and as it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's wisdom that it passes down to us, uh, whether that's something that's literally believed in or not, uh, that I think he saw that as, as one of the greatest fonts of uh, the wisdom and the, uh, the knowledge that we should retain and have respect for as we chart our way forward. Thank you, Daniel. Please give Daniel Crownhammer a round of applause.